Mahesh Patel from Birla Mutual Fund is now joining us. Mahesh, thank you so much for taking our time for us. Uh, you know, last when we spoke and now, one of the key differences has been the response to any of the IPOs that we have seen, the sort of subscription levels, the sort of interest in any new IPO. Do you believe that this year will also be good for the IPO markets? Yeah, so recently, because of the buoyancy in the market, we have seen a lot of IPOs coming in <coughs> the market and quite a few of them are actually been a lot of PE investors who have been early investors in some of these companies trying to take the opportunity to uh, really find some exits. I mean, some of these companies actually don't require capital because uh, they're not capital intensive sectors. In fact, if you've seen a trend, most of the companies are in sectors where uh, slightly capital light sectors. We haven't seen really large IPOs coming in from uh, highly capital intensive sectors. So, uh, and, and these are medium sized companies, uh, most of them. And uh, there has been a good interest uh, coming in from the uh, primary market. And uh, yeah, so I think the listing gains also have been uh, fairly good. So I think that should keep the market alive. And you could see, uh, I mean, there is a deal pipeline is looking pretty strong for this calendar year as well. Right. Do you think it's also because of the recent run up in the market? So some of the existing ideas are looking very expensive. That's why people are chasing new sectors, new sort of companies which are coming on the block. So it's not like these, some of these companies which are coming in the IPO market are exactly cheap. Uh, we have seen that the listing itself, uh, uh, the gains have been, uh, they get priced in immediately in terms of the uh, current uh, valuations of the stocks. And a lot of these sectors which are coming in are not really have parallels in the market. There are, some of them are really emerging sectors, not many companies in the listed space uh, to really do a comparable over there. But uh, I think, yeah, with liquidity around uh, enough, uh, so there is appetite uh, for people to really look at some of these uh, new opportunities. And especially with uh, new sectors, emerging sectors, where the longer term growth outlook is good, uh, I think that's where uh, market is trying to, uh, I mean, we've seen a good response for some of these companies. Right. Let's talk about the markets as a whole. So Nifty is at 9200 levels or around the 9200 levels. Uh, you know, we've had two big events last week. One is what has happened with the, the UP elections and second is what is happening as far as Fed is concerned. Do you think both of this, the outcome that we have seen, deserves, deserves a PE expansion? So, I mean, the UP elections uh, clearly brings around a lot of political stability. Uh, I think that's what I think the market uh, would uh, be positive about. Uh, apart from that, I don't think it uh, really... Uh, uh, changes the picture much uh, in terms of this thing. But I think uh, once you get that stability, then the people's ability to really look at the longer term uh, increases. So, so then I think one can still factor in uh, uh, that you would have a stable government for the next another uh, five years. And the longevity of the sustainability of the growth becomes much stronger. So to that extent, yeah, there could be some uh, case for a higher P multiple or at least the multiple to sustain at, at higher levels. Uh, apart from the global events, uh, I don't see any uh, much of a change. I think it's in, been in line uh, with what we have seen. But some of the factors why, I mean, the market P multiples are higher and, and could sustain. I mean, obviously, there could be a marginal correction because of a lot of global events. But the fact that the earnings uh, are still depressed, uh, we've seen that the ROEs are still at a kind of a 8 to 10 year kind of a low. So we are not looking at the market at peak uh, uh, earnings growth. We are still at a cyclical bottom. And with uh, earnings growth outlook uh, looking better, at least that's what the market is hoping up. So if that uh, turns out, and the market's multiples can uh, still sustain. And also mind you that we are at a scenario where while we compare with historical P multiples uh, and the market looks expensive, uh, the, the, uh, the risk-free rate also is a bit lower than the historical average. So that would also mean that uh, the, uh, with the cost of capital and cost of equity look, uh, looking lower, uh, multiples can be justified at a slightly higher levels. So I think all these factors uh, put together, I think, uh, I think we are in a scenario where the valuations would remain uh, slightly higher than the long-term average. And uh, I think uh, we'll have to really look at earnings growth for the markets to uh, deliver. I think. Uh, expecting P re-rating from these levels can happen because of probably liquidity coming, but not be sustainable. Right. Uh, as far as earnings are concerned, do you believe that earnings would likely grow in the last few years? You know, so last year we had uh, the issue of PSU banks, the metal prices going down significantly. This year we've had demonetization. <clears throat> do you believe FI18 would probably be a year where earnings would actually be in line or higher? So as we move forward uh, from this fiscal and next next fiscal year. I think uh, for the next couple of quarters, probably the earnings uh, would still be uh, a bit tepid because the demonetization impact will linger in a bit in the fourth quarter. And then moving into the next year, first quarter, we have the GST implementation, which could lead to some disruption 
but I think after that, uh, I think we we are seeing a pretty strong uh, recovery uh, in earnings in the uh, next fiscal year. Uh, primarily uh, because of the lower base of this year itself, we have seen the second half of this year has got impacted because of demonetization. So that should uh, be a good base for the market earnings to look higher next year. Also, a lot of sectors like uh, banking, for example, as rightly mentioned. Uh, this year has been a pretty bad year for a lot of the corporate banks and the uh, PSU banks. We have seen a large uh, dip in profits. So that should normalize even if you do not assume any kind of a uh, further improvement uh, in the NPA cycle. I think that uh, that sharp decline uh, what we saw this year should, uh, uh, should kind of normalize next year. So that should aid uh, the growth. Also metals as you rightly said uh, where we are seeing stability in the metal prices and outlook over there. So that uh, should also be uh, a strong driver for earnings growth. Partly we have seen in uh, second half of this year, but uh, it will continue into, into the next year also. And then there are other sectors like pharma again, which has seen uh, pretty lackluster earnings last year because of some of the companies uh, could not really get uh, approvals for new products because of the plant issues, which is now getting uh, resolved. We have seen a lot of companies get through. So I think if you combine all these factors, then I think next year uh, earnings growth in excess of 15 percent look fairly uh, uh, plausible. And that is what the market is really hoping for and that is why the multiples are sustaining. If that does not happen, then probably, yeah, I mean, there is no reason for the multi multiples to remain at these levels. Right. But, you know, the pointers that you are making, do not you think the 16 percent numbers, 15 percent number that the street is already factoring in, the consensus number for growth, is already factoring in this? Yeah, to some extent, yeah, it is it's factored in. but. Uh, I think it is more important to look at uh, whether beyond uh, FI18, as we move into FI18, if we get more confidence that the uh, growth is likely to sustain and, and some of the sectors, I mean GST benefit uh, if that really uh, turns out and we can see a more uh, sustainable longer term uh, growth trajectory for the, for the economy and then uh, down to the companies, I think then uh, the, the market probably is uh, uh, still not really factoring that kind of uh, longer term sustainable growth. Right. As far as, uh, you know, the flows are concerned, can you just talk to us about the mutual fund flows? Ha do they continue to be strong and especially after demonetization, did you expect it to be as strong as it has been? Mutual fund flows, I mean, have been steady uh, all throughout the last calendar year and they continue and that is a big uh, trend change what we have seen. So I think uh, demonetization has only helped that uh, in terms of trying to further increase the uh, whatever liquidity which has come into this banking system to get channelized into better investment or alternatives. So um, I think the whole shift of savings from uh, physical assets to financial savings is uh, a trend which we saw that uh, play out last year and I think it continues to play down. Uh, going forward and that should help to support the flows what we are seeing into the uh, uh, into the mutual fund industry. I think as long as a lot of this thing is coming in through a steady uh, monthly SIP flow that gives a lot of stability uh, to these flows. Right. As far as uh, you know a fund manager like you is concerned at 9200 level, do you find it difficult to get ideas and deploy fresh funds? So, I mean, it is always uh, our endeavor to look at companies okay, where we find uh, potentially value or mispricing in the market uh, to generate the extra return vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark. Uh, at these levels, yeah, with liquidity, I think there are few opportunities where uh, one can spot those. But I think uh, if one is uh, patient and, and, and also I think if we really try to uh, take a view slightly longer, because market tends to price in things which are probably over the next one year or two years max. I think uh, it does not really have the vision to really look beyond. So that is where uh, our abilities and our research to really look at beyond the next two years, looking into next three to five years view on a company becomes very important at these levels of market valuations to able to really see uh, where, the, where the value is. And that is what I think our uh, uh, effort has been to really look at, I mean, beyond three years as we have uh, we are looking at ideas uh, from a three-year perspective or five-year perspective to uh, really uh, uh, look by good companies at, uh, at, at if you discount that say earnings three or five down the line, then probably yeah, there is value in a few stocks. I mean, Endeavor is really identify those, those opportunities uh, in this market at this point in time. 
Right. Uh, you know, if we just look at the recent moves, so, you know, today ITC is up some 5 6%. We earlier had Reliance, which uh, uh, did well. Telecom stocks have done well. You think market is focusing in on names that are underperforming or names that are slightly uh, less owned as well? So that sector rotation and stock rotation uh, is uh, likely to happen and especially uh, when we see markets kind of reaching at levels valuations where other lot of the other sectors are at uh, fairly or slightly higher above the long term. So we see some of the laggards uh, start to play and that's been a phenomenon of what we saw. We saw the IT sector uh, do well uh, in the last month and, and, and yeah, I mean stocks which have been uh, underperforming because of various reasons I think there could be a reason for any slight positive developments can lead to a significant uh, up move over there. I think pharma is another sector which has still uh, been a laggard and hasn't seen. I think probably it's turn for that sector to really look up uh, from these levels. Right, but you know, uh, as you said, that as a fund house, you're always looking at two year, three year opportunity. Now, considering India has always been a growth market, uh, some of the companies where the growth is now expanding at least the large ones, where the growth is now not expected to be as high as it used to be earlier, and the valuations are factoring in. They become a buy because as soon as the growth returns, some of the IT favorites, pharma favorites, uh, uh, you think would just get re-rated? Yeah, so I think, again, we have to see whether there is any structural issue in some of these sectors. Uh, so like, for example, in the IT sector, it looks difficult that the growth, uh, structural growth will really improve uh, significantly. And uh, so I think as uh, once gets uh, visibility that yeah, there is uh, a structural shift in the in the longer term growth trends, yeah, then uh, the sectors can potentially get uh, re-rated. So I think uh, one can't really generalize that uh, because uh, there are a lot of factors, okay, which right, for example, IT sector, the move toward digitization and, and the way things are happening, I think uh, uh, would be difficult for the sector to really come back to the growth rate what it had seen in, in the past. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, one has to be more pragmatic in terms of what's the kind of a re-rating which can happen. There's no point looking at the past historical P multiple because the market environment and the factors which were driving that could be different from what it is at, uh, at the current time. Right. Uh, so, you know, what are the themes that you would be looking at? Uh, can you just tell us some sectors that you like at this point of time? So, we... Uh, still uh, like the uh, domestic sectors uh, while the global growth outlook is also improving and some of the global sectors like IT and sorry not IT but uh, commodities are looking good and and with uh, production cuts in China I think we see a uh, sustainability of uh, prices at these levels and and while the stock prices have gone up I think the lot of India co companies are looking at deleveraging now uh, going forward with good free cash flow generation so we are uh, positive on the on the metals uh, sector. Uh, on the domestic uh, focus sectors, uh, we like the uh, consumer discretionary sex space. We think that's a longer term uh, sector where uh, uh, you would see a stronger growth as per capita incomes uh, go up. And, and also the shift from unorganized to organized, uh, which will be uh, GST will further help to uh, crystallize that, uh, will help some of these companies to really grow faster than the broader industry growth rate. So a lot of these uh, consumer discretionary across the spectrum is, is what uh, we are positive on. And uh, private banks uh, continue to, I think, uh, like those. We think uh, the PSU banks are still constrained because of lack of capital and uh, private banks will continue to take market share. Even the NBFC, while they have outperformed in the last couple of years, we think uh, well, good NBFCs which are positioned in the markets where the banks are not able to cater to should uh, continue to show a stronger growth and with good liquidity around. Uh, uh, so I think they shouldn't have challenge in terms of on the liability side. So, so uh, NBFCs, uh, we think, uh, again, look good from a uh, longer term perspective. So I think these are the sectors where uh, we've, we are uh, over. Otherwise, I think most of the sectors are kind of neutralish ish um, or, or slightly uh, underweight. Right, so let's talk about these sectors one by one. So metals is what you said is interesting. Uh, say if the prices were to stay at these levels, you think a lot of the debt problems for at least some of the large cap listed companies would be behind? So even if prices were to go down a little bit, it will only be an EBITDA cut and not necessarily a question mark on sustainability of these companies, which was the case in uh, uh, Feb 2016? So I think, uh, I mean, there are two kinds of companies in the metal space, one which are very highly levered. And for them, the problems will still continue because the leverage is, uh, the debt is so high on their book 
that uh, the current EBITDA even at these prices will be difficult to service that. So, they definitely they will require restructuring, but uh, there is a now a viable option. So, so, a lot of these companies are there in the uh, banks books where they are looking at some kind of a resolution. And if there is a restructuring that it happens, at least there is a viability over there and these companies can revive. So, I think that is that's a positive. The other stronger companies, okay, where the debt is uh, moderately higher, uh, I think uh, you will clearly see them uh, paring down that debt over the next two to three years because uh, you would see a decent uh, cash flow generation. And, and there is no large capex which uh, some of these companies are foreseeing in the, in the near term. So, so clearly, uh, we are looking at uh, debts coming down for the at least the top uh, three, four names. And, and that can, even if the uh, overall EV remains the same, debt reduction, reduction can also uh, drive uh, equity valuations uh, over, the, uh, over the medium term. Right. And overall on the commodity outlook, would you also include crude into it? Crude is something which is, uh, again, the factors driving that are a bit different. Uh, we have seen uh, production cuts uh, which has uh, happened uh, for the prices to really move up. But again, crude dynamics are a bit different. We have uh, US pumping in more uh, from shale oil which is coming into the market and at a price uh, which is uh, lower than what used to be earlier. So that caps the upside over there uh, for crude. And then uh, longer term crude has got alternatives uh, fuel which is which is bringing, bringing down the overall longer term trajectory for crude prices uh, lower. So, uh, I would not say uh, crude is probably disconnected from other uh, commodities and that is what we have seen recently happen and that trend uh, uh, will continue. So, not so positive on crude, I think it will remain uh, pretty range bound and, and longer term I think crude prices look to be lower than what they are at this point in time. Right. As far as, uh, you know, consumer staples are concerned, so some of these consumer companies actually fell after demonetization, but now they have rebounded back, primarily from the point that you were saying that, you know, a lot of unorganized market will likely get hit from demonetization plus GST. Uh, is it uh, limited to the durable names because that's where there is a lot of unorganized market? Yeah, essentially it's in the uh, consumer durable and discretionary sector where uh, you would see a lot of unorganized sectors which is there because uh, so, these are companies in the building material uh, sector, the retailing sector and, and some of these uh, uh, consumer white goods sector where uh, we see a lot of uh, unorganized players coming in and, and, and that is where uh, demonetization has shown that some of the organized players in this sector have not been so impacted and they could, could manage it much better and, and GST uh, would uh, further see a shift uh, over there because the tax uh, uh, tax kind of a leakages with some of these unorganized sector used to do was a source of competitive advantage which will kind of diminish uh, once GST comes in. So, yeah, I think, but again these are uh, sectors which are primarily in the, uh, I would say, they are not very large uh, sector, these are medium size uh, industries which one is uh, looking at and most of the companies in this sector would fall in the uh, in, in, in the mid cap or in the small cap uh, uh, in terms of market capitalization. Right, uh, but you know what you are saying would be also true for the org entire organized retail space. So, wherever there is a big unorganized market and the organized retail player is listed uh, with decent market share and good balance sheet, uh, that essentially would become an overweight. Yeah, so again, uh, one has to look at whether the company has the ability uh, to really uh, uh, force through and get this market share, okay, if they have any competitive advantage uh, to do it, either from a strong brand, a stronger distribution. I think yeah, if they have, have those factors, yeah, then it is clearly for them to really uh, grow and increase their market share uh, within the uh, overall pie. Right, and also for uh, particularly retail, so we saw the response to DMART IPO which just concluded. Uh, do you think the retail space also could be a big beneficiary of GST? I am talking about, uh, you know, entire retail chain or retail store, not particularly a branded chain. Uh, retail sector, again, yeah, to some extent uh, we do not see any big uh, benefit for the uh, retailing sector uh, to come in because, but I think the, the shift over there uh, is happening because of various reasons. I think the scale benefits for some of the organized player in terms of sourcing and uh, be able to pass on those benefits to the end consumer are the key reasons for the sector to really uh, uh, doing well. And I think that is uh, something uh, irrespective of the, of the GST and other uh, benefits which could come in. I think GST will benefit, but uh, we do not see a, a big uh, impact of that uh, on the sector. 
Right, you mentioned about private banks. Now, last five years, private banks have done exceptionally well. They've continued to grow and show that, you know, even if the industry is not growing, uh, they can gain market share and grow. Still, you believe there is a lot of room for some of the top private banks to gain market share and, you know, in turn, continue their 15, 20% growth on the profitability? I think as long as the uh, private banks uh, continue to really focus on the uh, asset side well, and and uh, also on on the retail side. So retail side, I think we have seen a stronger growth, and and ability to really price risk properly. Uh, then they can continue to gain market share. I think uh, still now, almost 65% of the loans uh, in the system are with the uh, PSU banks. So private sector, while they have growth, okay, they are individually. If you look at, they are still very small in terms of market share. So I think uh, uh, looking at the trend. And, uh, and 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 some of these banks have been able to carve out certain niche in few segments and some of the emerging segments i think it's quite possible uh, that the shift what we are seeing and the growth rates of around uh, upwards of around 15% 20% can continue uh, in the uh, over the next few years Right. As far as uh, private banks are concerned, you know, in the last one year, there has also been a differentiation. So corporate banks like Access and ICICI are trading at one level of valuation and names like Yes and Indescent are trading at the other level of valuation. So that's also changed in the last 12 to 18 months. Do you believe that corporate private banks is also a space that you would look at? Would you expect recovery over there? Corporate banks are, uh, I mean, we've seen some resolutions uh, coming in at least uh, clarity on a few sectors which was stressed like the metal space where uh, the increase in the metal prices is uh, uh, looking better for some of the stressed companies in that sector and and broadly the belief is that the NPA is what we have seen has kind of peaked out but having said that uh, we are still seeing that resolution which was supposed to happen for uh, companies which uh, which have already been declared as NPAs is taking time and and that could probably weigh down on these companies for a couple of quarters. But I think as the broader recovery in the market happens, uh, we should see uh, some of the stronger uh, names uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in the corporate banking space. Uh, they should uh, do well. So yeah, I think selectively uh, corporate banks, uh, we, uh, I think one should start looking at this point in time because in a recovery in the market recovery or economic recovery, uh, yeah, there is a potential for some of these uh, banks to uh, potentially uh, re-rate and, and uh, give a better returns. But again, we are not seeing across the board uh, corporate banks uh, coming out uh, strongly from this crisis. It will be a slow and, and gradual process. But uh, NPA resolution, that's the key for these corporate banks? Yeah, so that, that remains a key this thing. And uh, I think if we see a few successes over there, uh, I think you'll get a more confidence that things are now moving in the right direction. I think because of some of the issues which happened uh, in, a, uh, in a few cases, I think there is some hesitancy from especially the PSU banks to go and resolve some of these issues to take those decisions. But uh, I think we need to see one or two cases really come through uh, well uh, with resolutions uh, for uh, really uh, the market to gain confidence that we are in a way where we could see resolutions and that would mean that the provisionings which has been there on the books will start to come down because uh, if the resolutions don't happen then uh, because of the way provisions are being provided I mean every year okay that percentage increases and that will continue to weigh down on terms of uh, profit for some of the corporate banks. Right. Uh, you know, uh, so you like private banks for two reasons. One is, of course, what's happening as far as uh, the uh, NPA is concerned, the way they have been lending. And the second is the growth. So even if there is an NPA resolution in some of these banks, do you expect corporate loan growth to pick up? That will also be a trigger? Yeah, so corporate loan growth would also help because if your top line improves, then uh, your uh, percentage terms, your NPA, then this thing would look lower because... And that has also been a challenge uh, because overall loan growth has been um, around 5-6% for the banking sector. And uh, yeah, if that improves, that will also help uh, for some of the banks to really, as, as a percentage, your NPAs will gross NPAs will start to look uh, lower. And we are seeing, uh, so we, are, uh, we think that the, uh, the, the loan growth overall for the banking sector should pick up uh, next year at least to around 11-12%, which is in line with your nominal GDP growth. And uh, yeah, and a lot of, uh, we had seen a disintermediation happen in the banking sector. Now uh, with the banks and the markets had moved toward the CP, CD 
uh, market now with banks cutting their interest rates, I think some of the money should flow back uh, uh, into the from, from the banking uh, sector lending. So I think given these factors, uh, one should should expect the at least the loan growth overall for the banking sector to move up from the subdued levels. Right. Also, just a word on NBFCs. You mentioned that also, also as one of your top picks or top sector bets. Uh, what's the call there? Would it be a way to play the rural economy? So the NBFCs are, I mean, they are in various sectors. You have NBFCs in the mortgage finance side and the consumer uh, durables space uh, in the in the microfinance uh, spec sector. So, uh, so it's a whole basket of that, not necessarily uh, the rural alone, obviously in the rural space also where uh, some of the NBFCs are there because the banks are not able to really uh, provide credit to some of these uh, uh, players. So it's uh, I think overall growth uh, what what we see in especially in, in borrowers okay who are still not uh, really uh, prime borrowers for the for the banks and NBFCs with their better capabilities on the ground ability to really identify and assess the risk and the cash flows of some of these borrowers and lend on that basis is the strength which is there and and that market is still not uh, is still under penetrated there is still enough appetite uh, for growth over there so i think that's an area where uh, the the nbfcs are able to grow and and they are not still large uh, in that space so as uh, some of the nbfcs are still uh, in size which are still small and they can continue to grow and expand that market so that's what uh, really looks exciting uh, in, in in this sector uh, which uh, which we have seen exhibit uh, pretty strong growth uh, even in the last year and that growth will continue uh, in the in the in the foreseeable future Mahesh, thank you so much for taking out time for us. Always a pleasure.